It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about uh, what we can expect in the future is the fortune teller, Rick Becker. Thanks for being here, Rick. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> you. Before we get into this too much, your two blogs, uh, one, God Haunted Lunatic. We've talked about that before and where that name comes from. Your right. other one, Clinging to Onions. Uh, oh, is, yes. Where does Clinging to Onions come from? That's a great question. Um, it's actually a reference to uh, uh, Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Um, huh. I forget the character who actually uh, tells the tale, but uh, it's a story about a woman who led a very, almost like, almost like a uh, rich man and Lazarus tale, where huh. it was a woman who was very greedy and very selfish, and she would have beggars outside of her door, and she wouldn't give them anything except for one day she threw a rotten onion from her plate. Uh, to a beggar outside of her door. And when this woman, kind of like I said, Lazarus and Rich Man, when she ended up in perdition, and the, the person who received that onion ended up in heaven, she called up and asked for that person to help her go from where she was, the older woman, from where she was up to heaven. And so the person held down the onion. And when the woman grasped onto the onion and was being lifted up to heaven, and other people from hell were holding on to her and hoping to go up with her. She was batting them away because she wanted the onion for herself. And eventually God let go of the onion and she fell back down. Hmm. So in a sense, the reference is to clinging to onions, clinging to those opportunities that we have to demonstrate our love for Jesus through our actions and to be as, as selfless as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, not as a, you know, obviously not as works righteousness, but as a reflection of our faith and our love for Christ. Oh. So that's where the reference comes from. So yeah. that's what I Well, jumping into our topic for today, where I said you're going to be talking about the future, and you wrote an article for the NC Register that people can find at ncregister.com. And I mean, right now we've got spring, the time of new life and growth, but you chose to write about death. What, yes. <laughs> what, ins- what inspired that? Well, as my students said, I teach nursing. It's my full-time job uh-huh. um, at Bethel College uh, in Mishawaka. And um, we always start with death and dying as our first module, which some of them think is curious because they go into nursing, they think, to be saving lives and mm-hmm. doing CPR and all that exciting stuff. Sure. But as I explained to my students, I mean, the end game for all of us, uh, you could save somebody. If you do CPR and you successfully resuscitate somebody who, who was on the point of death, that person's going to die eventually. Mm-hmm. So we have to, as Christian healthcare providers and as Christians in general, we, we need to have a bigger view of what life is all about. It's not just preserving biological life, but it's using this time that God has given us to prepare uh, for what we will all be facing, which is what the church calls the four last things, uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, or hell, I should say, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that pretty much every day ought to be oriented to having that in mind. So that's kind of why I I chose to write about this now, because there's no better time to be thinking about that than during Lent. Yeah. One of the things you said is kind of jumping to the end of the article, which is that's where we're heading to death. Like that's the eventuality of, but you also mentioned about talking about it with your kids. And as a father of seven yourself, I was kind of curious, when do you start talking about these things with kids and how? Huh? Well, that's, uh, again, because of my profession as a nurse, and before I started teaching nursing, I, I worked in um, cancer care and hospice care. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, <laughs> you know, I, the name of my blog is God Haunted, but I, I would imagine my kids would probably say that our house is kind of death haunted. That it, mm. it's, uh, it's actually something that, uh, that comes up pretty regularly because as I tell them about my work, and I talk to them about what my students deal with and what we see on a daily basis when we're caring for patients in nursing homes and hospital, that in a sense, all disease really is a foretaste or a, uh, a shadow of death. It's something that uh, we consider uh, always on the edge, right? Um, that we're always fighting a battle for our current health, but uh, we all know that it, in the end, in terms of physical life, we're going to lose that war. So it's something we talk about a lot. And frankly, too, this is going to sound pretty morbid, but my kids all know that my wife and I have already picked out our plots, and I've even taken some of the kids to show them. This mm-hmm. is where your mom and dad are going to be permanently kind of residing someday, at least our bodies. So it's a way of normalizing it, not with being morbid, but that this is a dimension of who we are as Catholics. 
that we shouldn't be afraid of, uh, and in a sense can even anticipate and prepare for, certainly. So that, that is the context that we, at least I do, talk about the faith pretty regularly with my kids. Well, and the fact that you put so many disclaimers on that, say <laughs> multiple times during that explanation, you said this might sound morbid. We have made it such a, like, we don't want to talk about death. We don't want to talk about dying. And it has become kind of taboo to even bring up the subject, even amongst our own family. So why do you think that is? How have we gotten to that point where something that is inevitable, the one guarantee, perhaps other than taxes in our life, is that we're going to die. Why is it something that we're so scared to talk about? Well, I, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you ought to come to one of my classes. Uh, <laughs> I should. I'd love but, that. Uh, I, I, I'd say it on a number of different levels. For one thing, it's a, it's a lack of information. I think it's a lack of formation, both in terms of catechesis, perhaps. That may be an area where we're likely to skip over kind of quickly, especially for younger kids. I don't think we need to. But I think in the general public, there's a, a misapprehension or a misunderstanding of what it's all about that, especially these days... And this actually connects to the uh, consistent life ethic as well. You know, people have this idea that dying is somehow painful, that dying is somehow to be dreaded because it is so agonizing. But the fact is that medical science today, with very, very rare exceptions, if any, have developed the means to make that passage, and it ought to be a passage, as uh, pain-free and even symptom-free as possible. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an information problem. But I I do think it's also, uh, culturally, we don't like death because death, in human terms, represents failure. (laughs) You know, I I don't want to speak for my brothers and sisters uh, who are doctors, but medicine, I think, in general, does have an orientation to preserving life, that they are somehow successful when biological life continues, Mm -hmm. and that death, in a sense, represents maybe um, a failure. But I think the best doctors, and certainly those in the nursing field, know this, that they've come to terms with the fact that death is inevitable and that trying to make that transition from at the end of life, we use the word good death. You know, we want people mm-hmm. to experience a good death. And a good death is not just about control of symptoms and, and mm-hmm. relief of pain, but it's also preparing, you know, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, reconnecting with people. And that's something we can be doing all the time. If we always are thinking to ourselves, as as is true, we could die today. We ought to be thinking when we wake up, what am I going to do today to be prepared for my death? How am I going to conduct my relationships? How am I going to speak and think? How am I going to uh, respond to problems? I think that idea of preparing for a good death is uh, ought to be something that's maybe even at the center of our spiritual lives. You know, I teach my students, as part of their unit on death and dying, I, I have them read the, uh, uh, speaking of Russian authors, I have them read Tolstoy's um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, which is a short novella, and I recommend it to all your listeners. So you, you can get it online, you get it at the library. But it's a, it's a short novella in which Ivan Ilyich suffers an injury, and he goes through the dying process. And it, Tolstoy has this tremendous insight into what it's like, the fears, the wrestling, the refusal uh, to accept it. But in my mind, I see Ivan Ilyich in this novella that Tolstoy wrote, in the end, does experience a type of reconciliation and, and even a, uh, a redemption and does experience a good death, though from the outside, it looks like what he's suffering is in every way bad. But it's because it's a more holistic view of what's happening at hmm. the end of life. I, I mentioned the consistent life ethic. You know, the, the Greek word for good death is euthanasia. And of course, our culture thinks <laughs> euthanasia, when they think of good death, they think of ending suffering. So that's why we're struggling in our society right now with how we handle end of life and to shorten it, right? There's this idea that the best thing for people to do when they're suffering at the end of life is just to cut it short. Put them out of their misery. It put them out of their misery, yeah. right? Whereas a Catholic and a Christian perspective, a biblical perspective, is one in which we embrace suffering as an right. opportunity to grow in our Christ-likeness that we, uh, we know from New Testament. I mean, Jesus says it over and over, and it's in Paul, and it's all over the place, that being a Christian means embracing the cross. Mm-hmm. And that means not shying away from it, but in a sense, reconciling us to it and not seeking it out, again, again, I, I, maybe I'm a little bit too apologetic about this, you don't want to sound morbid, 
but in a sense, how can I better suffer? I know I'm going to suffer. I know I'm going to die. So how can I best prepare for that in a way that reflects my love for Christ Mm -hmm. and my faith in what it's all about, which is gaining heaven, becoming a saint? Yeah. We're just going to scratch the surface of this article. People are going to have to check it out, read it over at at the ncregister.com. You made it a nice list. It's 10 things about four things, but actually the four things is really three things because you have death, (laughs) judgment, heaven, and hell, but you really only have the choice of one of the last two, heaven or hell. So death, judgment, and then eternity. Can you talk a little bit about judgment and the different stages of judgment? Uh, Sure. What the church teaches us, and again, based on scripture and tradition, uh, is that there's actually two judgments. There's the particular judgment, which happens at the moment of death, which does, it's individualized and tailored to the individual. And in a sense, if you, if you want to put it this way, it's like a one-on-one meeting with God. Uh, and it's at that moment that decides our eternal future. So it's a, it's a one-on-one review of our lives. And it really what it boils down to is and I think I'm stealing this from C.S. Lewis, but uh, it's whether we bend the knee at that moment of death or if we stand in defiance. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, even after that review of all of our lives and all our life choices and dying in in grace or dying in mortal sin, I mean, we know that everyone has the opportunity to decide at the moment of death, who are we choosing? Are we choosing Christ? Are we going to defy him? Are we going to reject him? And that's the particular judgment, and that decides where our soul ends up ultimately, heaven or hell. And as I say in the article, uh, we, you know, purg- what about purgatory, people say? Well, purgatory is like a, a suburb of heaven. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I like that. It's not like a mini hell. It's like right. a suburb of heaven. So if you're in purgatory, you know that in time, <laughs> you will be in heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the general judgment, or the last judgment, which Michelangelo did such a masterful job depicting in Sistine Chapel on the wall, is that it's like a corporate review of our lives and our track record, which instead of being one-on-one, it's going to be on display for the whole universe. And I, uh, I compare it to, in a sense, uh, it's almost like having a, you know, in your job, if you have a a general evaluation with your employer, it's almost like having that general evaluation in front of all of your colleagues uh, at the end of time. But in this case, it's all of everyone who's ever lived. And that, too, as the Catechism even says, if nothing else, the idea of the general, uh, that that last judgment ought to give us pause with regards to everything we do, every decision that we make, because we know (laughs) that all of the universe is going to know about it at the last judgment. Mm -hmm. That's not the best reason to choose virtue, but that's not a bad reason, right? We want to choose virtue out of love for Jesus, but choosing virtue is just like, you know, becoming a Christian. You, people become Christians for all kinds of reasons. Um, not, not wanting to go to hell is, a, is, is not the best reason, but it's not a bad reason. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's the two differences. There's one that's a one-on-one, our particular judgment at the moment of death, and then the general judgment at the end of the world, and which is associated, too, with the resurrection of the dead, which I also talk about in the article. When our souls, which have already received their eternal reward, heaven or hell, our souls will be reunited with our bodies in some mysterious way that you know we can't understand. But there will be some kind of continuity between our persons, our physical bodies on earth, and our eternal bodies, our resurrected bodies, or in heaven or elsewhere. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're just scratching the surface here. People are going to have to check out the article. You can find it at ncregister.com. It's 10 things to know about death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And where sh- you've got articles all over the internet here. Uh, where should we send people, though, to, to find out more about the stuff that you're writing? Well, thank you. Probably the best thing to do is just pop uh, God Haunted Lunatic. You can make it one word if you want to in Google, and it'll get to my stuff. All right. God Haunted Lunatic. Thank you Correct. so much, Rick Becker, for joining us and sharing us a little bit about uh, the future, really. Thanks for having me on. 